Education and Equality, 1865-1995. This is one of the better pictures I found of a one-room schoolhouse. It's nicely painted and it looks like it's in good repair. Uh, and I'm taking a quote directly from your text. Quote, there is an amazing high degree of correlation between what a state invests in education and the standard of living of its people, which I'm sure you're finding out already. But in 1865, right after the Brothers' War or the Civil War, our education system was in total shambles. I mean, what schools we did have, either one room or more, they were used for barracks, they were used for offices, they were used for hospitals. The ones who had been teaching, males especially, they were in the military. And education kind of went to the bottom of the list. When you're fighting for your freedom or your life, education doesn't seem that important. You're not going to go sit in a schoolroom. But the reason to become a teacher, I dearly loved. <laughs> Our text authors hit it right on the head, either out of desperation or dedication. And of course, women, it was one of the few professions that were respectable for a woman to get into. Uh, so she couldn't get a, have any other source of income. This would be something she could do if she had any education at all. But of course, once she was married, she was expected to leave the profession. And it wasn't just teaching. It was any profession. They didn't want married women around because, well, it was a male-dominated society, so the husband or the man was supposed to support the family, number one. And number two, we didn't want our innocent children knowing what was going on behind bedroom doors. For men, sometimes they had no other option. And then there were those who were dedicated enough that they actually thought that they could make a difference. But the teachers at this time frame, they were underprepared, underpaid, of course, and underappreciated, which isn't so much different from today. But the hiring process, that's what was so outrageous. The school districts, they uh, had their own little governing system. It was kind of like an autonomous county or something. Uh, they had total local control. And because of the apathy, they didn't see the importance of education. I mean, you don't need an education to birth a baby. You don't need an education to plant a roll of tobacco. Uh, sometimes they, too, were illiterate. They just had way too much control. And the school trustees, oh, my goodness. They set the taxes, they hired the teachers, they fixed the salaries of the teachers, they decided what books to be used in the school, and of course they would even be known to accept bribes to, for a teacher to get a job. And finally the state sets up testing requirements. Well, there's a way around that. You'll just sell an exam copy to someone so they can know what the test is going to be before they take it. The office of the school superintendent wasn't established until 1884, and it too is going to be a very powerful position. He's going to control the hiring of the bus drivers and the cooks and the janitors and the teachers. He's going to decide who is going to receive a contract to do work at the school, who's going to receive a contract to supply books for food. And because it is such a powerful position and he has a power to hire and fire, you're going to probably want to do what you can to make him happy. So if he wants you to vote for someone, you will. But the school itself, in 1920s, we still had one-room schoolhouses. We had one-room schoolhouses up into the 1940s. 50% uh, of all schools were one room in the 1920s. And it started at 8 o'clock in the morning with a recess in the morning, a brief one. Recess in the afternoon. You did get an hour for lunch. But for most of the one-room schoolhouses, the only lunches you had were what you brought in your lunch pail or your bucket. And they dismissed at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. But rural attendance, and I think this is just common sense, it would depend on the planting season. Uh, the young boys and girls were needed to help harvest and to plant. But the normal school year at this point in history was seven months long from September, which is after, pretty much after the harvest, through March, to right before the planting season. But even so, by the 1920s, only one-third of those eligible to attend actually did attend because, like I say, what was the need of an education? And when you would go in to teach a one-room schoolhouse, the ages would vary from the very young to... 18, 19, 20-year-olds, and sometimes the students would be older and bigger than the teacher. Well, the rural schools actually stayed about two and a half years behind those of the city school when you would do testing. But in the city schools, they did have more options. I mean, you had roads you could get to school in. Uh, sometimes you would have lighted streets where you could see if it was dark or rainy. Uh, they had kindergarten. But in the, in the uh, urban areas, not the urban, but the rural areas, of course, like I said, the planting and the harvesting seasons would determine whether the child was going to go to school or help the parents plant, whether it would prevent transportation. And there again, the attitude of the citizens. They didn't see the need. And of course, money was the biggest reason, or I should say, lack of money. And of course, in the large cities, they had a bigger taxable base, but I'm quoting from your text again, local taxation by the districts 
were subjected to the will of the people, unquote. And it was a total failure because people just didn't see any need to pay more taxes than they were, especially taxes for school and education, which they did not consider needed. So apathy and opposition to taxation. The salaries ranged from nine thirty-three to twenty-eight dollars per month, which meant that most of the time you wouldn't be able to pay rent. You'd have to live one week here and one week there, maybe a month here at the students' homes. So the rural one-room schools were not very nice, and they were almost a punishment rather than a place of learning. Now this picture, I, I think we had this earlier in one of our other segments, um, as a one-room schoolhouse, and it pretty much goes along with the description of your text. White frame, stone pillars up, you know, with wind blowing underneath the floor, and you probably had a leaky roof and broken windows. If you were lucky, you had a pot-bellied stove sitting in the middle of the schoolroom. The drinking water would be from a well outside, and according to your text, they had a common bucket. But now, folks, when I was going to the one-room schoolhouse, and I think it was the last one in Henderson County, they, uh, we would take a sheet of paper out of our big chief notebook, and we'd fold it down and make a little triangular-type drinking cup, and we'd go out and drink out of that. We didn't have a common bucket. But we did have outside toilets. Uh, on one side of the building was for the girls, and on the other side for the boys. And we were really uptown because our outside toilets had two holers. Inside, there would be a chalkboard up at the front of the classroom, and although it didn't mention it in your text, usually each row was a row of seats with a different grade, and they'd have a globe where the teacher could show you where in the world you are, and very, very few books. But even with all the bad stuff, even with all the leaky roofs and broken windows, and underpaid teachers who did persevere, learning did take place, because the teachers would inspire their students. And it happened time and time again. But then you've got the black students. Now these newly freed black people that had received their freedom in 1865, they only really wanted three things. They wanted land to grow their own food, they wanted to be able to vote, and they wanted an education. And if they had those three things, they would be as good as a white man. But education was a key, and all over the South, all over the country, it was amazing how much the young went to go to school because the parents forced them to go so that they would become better. Uh, the older went to learn how to read the Bible. They knew that they were never going to be able to bring themselves up if they didn't learn how to read and write. To the white man, especially in Kentucky, education was, well, it, like I said, it wasn't necessary for white folks, so why would it be necessary for the black folks? But if Education was okay as long as it taught them to be a better worker. In 1866, a law was passed in Kentucky that, that mandated you had to have schools for the blacks. Of course, separate. So now the state is going to have two school systems, a black school system and a white school system that they have to support in a time when we really didn't have a lot of money. The problem is that they wouldn't use white tax money for the black schools. Now, the blacks were paying taxes, and a lot of times they were paying tuition to schools, but they would take the black tax money and give it to the poor people first. And by the time they distributed what little tax money they had to the poor, there was nothing left for education. So enter something called the Freedmen's Bureau, and they managed to come up with 267 schools being built and over 13,000 black pupils. But Kentucky hated the Freedmen's Bureau. They were still perturbed at the government for having us under martial law for so long, they said that the Freedmen's Bureau was doing nothing but bringing in black people from the north who was going to cause problems, and there was no need for them, and it was discriminatory because it was helping one segment of population, and just on and on and on. We burned the schools, we whipped the teachers, we threatened the students, yet they still came. They still came. No matter what they did, they could not stop the African Americans from getting an education, and part of the problem was most of the teachers in Kentucky were black. In some of the further south states, they did have white teachers, but here most of the students, most of the teachers were black. In 1869, we finally get white schools get more revenue, but the black schools didn't get any. Finally, federal funds arrived, but even with federal funds, the distribution of the funds was uneven. A white student averaged a dollar forty-five, whereas a black student got forty-eight cents. So as you can see, we still had separate, but very definitely not equal. Well, something called the Colored Teachers State Association tries to combine the school funds. And the federal courts rule our, rule our funding, funding system is unconstitutional. In 1883, the courts ruled that the systems could be separate, but they must be equal. 
Uh huh. But still, the black schools are going to remain under equipped because of the way we go about funding. You know, you get funding from your district. But we begin to see more black educators. And pretty soon, we realize something strange is happening. The black teachers are better educated than the white teachers. Those statistics, 1921, 21% of all white teachers had some college. It wasn't required. 46% of all black teachers did. Now that's double, more than double. And discrimination in pay, of course, and, and just mentioned a few of the counties. In 19 of the counties, black teachers actually earned more money than the white teachers because of their level of education. And of course, in 58 counties, the black teachers earned considerably less regardless of their education. Meanwhile, Brewer College begins an integrated enrollment. They allowed interracial dating. Oh my, this is death, right? They even allowed the blacks to take part in leadership programs. Oh wow. Well, by 1904, our legislator Carl Day says this is contamination. We must get a bill passed to end this contamination. And he manages to get it through the legislature to end biracial education at Brera. So, but did Kentucky finally wake up and realize we really needed education? Uh, yes and no. Because by the turn of the century, coming into the 20th century, all southern states begin to fund education a little bit better. And by 1906, they're actually looking at training teachers. Oh my goodness, train people just to teach schools? This is a unique concept. And Kentucky also established Eastern Kentucky, Western Kentucky University, Moorhead State University, and Murray State University. And originally, they were all established primarily as neither nor or what we call normal schools, which is schools to teach teachers, or they would be... Um, vocational type schools. They begin to require a high school in every county and higher education is finally starting to receive more funding. There's a mammoth speaking tour all over the state to educate the public on the need for education and lo and behold uh, in one 11 year period we went from 157 high schools to 400 high schools. Great! This is wonderful. We're starting to educate our children. But what about all those grown-ups that can't read and write? And no, I don't expect you to remember all these years. I've got them here primarily to show you a chronological progression. Like in 1900, 16.5% of the whites were illiterate. Ten years later, it was down to 12%, and by 1920, down to 8%. But that's still an awful big percentage. But we got, we're working on the adults. So now we got to start working on the adults who are working who can become educated. So they start what they call moonlight schools, or we would call them night schools. And then they begin to focus on the rural areas like the Appalachia and the counties and that have no big cities. In 1920, Kentucky ranked 11th in the entire southern states per capita spending for students. But back in 1818, they had developed a division of vocational education. And this is great. And then they required teacher certification. Oh, we're coming along. Right, right. It took 15 years before they actually required a bachelor's degree from a person to be able to teach high school. A lot of places, if you just had an eighth grade education, you could teach. 1952, they lengthened the school term. 1940, by now, 63% of Kentucky's children are going to school, which is not good, but it's better than it was. Five years later, at the end of the war, we ranked last in the percentage of adults graduating from high school. And I say last, about 48 states we ranked last. Meanwhile, the legislature is reworking the inequality of the school funding uh, sometimes we have some white schools that are not getting good funding because they don't have a tax base in their county. But changes are coming. Meanwhile, uh, I'm not proud of this section. We are a nation of racists, and there's segregation all over the country, especially in the South. And this new organization that was founded back at the beginning of the century, the NAACP, it started going to court instead of trying to fight back because there's just more white people than there were black people and they were better armed, uh, it was better to do it legally. Uh, I start winning a few minor court battles. In 1941, a man named Eubanks, who was African American, applied to the University of Kentucky for admission. He was denied, it was a legal challenge, and it was dismissed. Seven years later, the day law is diluted a little bit because we've got black people wanting to learn how to be medical personnel and there's no courses in black schools offered, so they decided to allow them to take courses at white hospitals. Very narrow opening. Then a Navy veteran applies at the University of Kentucky. He's denied and goes to court and the court rules in favor of the veteran. He had to be admitted. By 1948, not only had the day law been diluted, 
but we now have 12 black students who are going to all white colleges. And of course, there's protests from parents. 1950, the legislature allows colleges to desegregate if the courses that the student needs are not being offered in a segregated setting or in a black school. So in the, if you can't get what you need, we'll let you in. Four years later, there's over 600 African Americans enrolled in formerly all white schools, which is a big step forward. And I know it doesn't seem like much, but baby steps. Now, this information, of course, is not in your text, and you've got a picture of Chief Justice Fred Grinson, but I want to spend just a little bit of time on him, number one, because he's a Kentuckian, and number two, we get a lot of what ifs. Of course, President Truman appointed him, and no, you don't need to know this, but he had 77 opinions uh, and 13 dissents. The one that I want you to read was he, he was, uh, when he read the decision not to review the conviction and death sentence of Julius and Ethel Rosenberg. Now, Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, which are not even mentioned in your text, were two Jewish people who were convicted of selling atomic secrets to the Russians. To this day, is still a mystery. Uh, we believe that they were really involved in some kind of conspiracy, but we don't believe that they were guilty of what they were charged, but they were sentenced to be executed in the electric chair. Uh, William O. Douglas granted a stay of execution, and the Chief Justice sent a special flight out to bring his vacation justices back to ensure that they were going to be executed because he was convinced that they were Russian spies. He also refused to hear the appeal of the Hollywood Ten. Now, the Hollywood Ten were a group of people in Hollywood who refused to answer questions because we had this big old red scare after World War II. And one of the things, it didn't affect us too much here in Kentucky, but for the rest of the country, it did. Uh, we were seeing communists under every rock. And they would have these uh, grand juries like we have now where you have to testify against yourself, which is supposed to be against the Constitution, but they can do it anyway. Um, they would ask questions, have you ever seen anybody go to a meeting? Did you know somebody was a communist? Did you ever hear them talk? And if you refused to answer, you were blacklisted or arrested for refusing to answer. And this Hollywood 10 were held in contempt and blacklisted and sent to jail uh, for decades. But the major issue is his court as Chief Justice, and it was very important that we had a Kentuckian, not only as Chief Justice, but we also had a couple of members of the court who were Kentuckians. But they dealt with racial segregation, labor unions, communism, big, big communism, and other loyalty oaths that uh, they were being forced to take in Washington, D.C. He was just getting ready to hear the Brown v. Board of Education when he had a heart attack and died. And the questions always remain, uh, how would he have voted? Would it, would it have been different? Would Brown v. Board of Education have passed if we hadn't had the Warren Court, if we had had the Vincent Court? He was a little bit of a uh, white supremacist, but he did try to follow the law, but he interpreted it very narrowly. Brown v. Board of Education. Yeah, I learned a new trick from my PowerPoints. I don't know for sure what I did, but I thought that was kind of cool. Imagine you're a seven-year-old black, and you have to walk one mile to a bus stop by walking to a railroad switch station and then waiting for a school bus to take you to a black elementary school which was a school where only black people went to. And a young girl by the name of Linda Brown this happened to. Uh, she was a third grader. And even though there was a white elementary school only seven blocks away, and uh, she was supposed to go to summer school that year, uh, they were not allowed to go. So her father took the case to court, and they lost the case, of course, because that segregation was the rule of the land. Then the NAACP decided to take the case all the way to the United States Supreme Court, because that's where you go when you lose your cases. If she had won, we would never have gone. And she became one of a class action of a dozen different students who were filing for the suit, but they picked one, and that's where it gets a name, but she wasn't the only child involved. 1954, after three long years, the case has finally ended, and I've got the timeline there. Uh, five years, or almost four years it took to get through. They found in favor of Linda Brown and the other African American children like her, and the Supreme Court said that it was not fair to have a black and white student separated in different schools. And I loved the vote that was dying to zero, not one dissent. So now we've ruled that the old Plessy v. Ferguson law from 19, 1894 is no longer valid. And in all honesty, the Louisville Cour Courier Journal came out in favor of it. Our two United States Senators were in favor of it. Uh, the then Governor Weatherby was in favor of it. Uh, well, whether they were in favor or not, they supported the decision. Let me refer, they supported the decision. But then uh, Weatherby's out and our beloved Happy Chandler's re-elected. 
And of course, there are protests from Kentucky public. But Chandler said, you know, we must support the law. And meanwhile, and your text points out, he, as a baseball commissioner, he was also trying to get baseball integrated. So maybe this had something to do with his decisions as governor because he, uh, he really loved baseball. But he did state that the court decision was now law of the land and we really did need to obey the law of the land. Day law was finally ruled unconstitutional, the whole business of it. And we have minor public protests, but they're pretty much peaceful. We don't have people grow up, throw up, I mean, show up and, you know, shout and have signs, but it really wasn't as bad in Kentucky as it was other places. But Chandler calls out the National Guard anyway. Meanwhile, the school officials, whether well, they support it, uh, they're going to obey the law so the schools are integrated. And by 1964, any school that was an all-black school was closed. So segregation dies quietly with just a little bit of a murmur in Kentucky. And we no sooner get that all out of the way and things are settling down and the civil rights protests start. The 1960s was uh, a time of turmoil, believe me. Uh, most people thought that everything that they knew and loved was coming to an end. The schools were integrated, but not the public facilities. We still had black drinking fountains and white drinking fountains, and we still had black swimming pools and white swimming pools. But in 1955, the C behind a person's name for colored was taken out of the city directory. So when you saw a name, you could not tell whether it was white or black. And the names, uh, Amelia Tucker, Georgia Davis, Lusky Twyman, uh, 61, 67, 68. It took a while. You get someone, a black lady elected to the legislature. You had a black lady elected as a state senator. And you had a black man elected as the mayor of Glasgow. We're more baby steps, believe me. We have sit-ins and we have boycotts. And they were successful in Lexington, Frankfurt, and Louisville. And as for what a sit-in is, basically they, students would walk into a lunch counter where they would not be served and sit down they would not respond to any heckling. They would not, if you spit on them or pour water on them, they would not respond. They would not move. Even if the policeman came in and picked them up and put, took them out, they'd go lamp. They no violence. But this information on the right of your screen, I found disturbing. I hope you did. Three young African Americans have refused treatment at a Hardinsburg hospital because they're black. And one dies on the waiting room floor. And this death le led to a new state law prohibiting the license of any hospital that would deny anyone emergency care, regardless of their race, color, or creed. Meanwhile, in 1954, a white couple who were in the forefront of civil rights movement, actually, uh, they bought a house in Louisville, a suburb of Shively, a uh, Louisville suburb of Shively, I'm sorry, and they were going to sell it to a black family. Of course, the family is harassed. And the Bradens are actually arrested and put on trial for sedition because no one would do this if they weren't communists. Because this is during the time of the Red Scare. Everything was blamed on the communists. So no white person decently would do anything that wasn't communist inspired. And as a matter of fact, it was communist inspired calling all these sit-ins. The house was finally bombed. But by 1961, the parks and bus terminals in Kentucky are integrated. Two years later, Governor Combs issues a Code of Fair Practices for state contracts. Oh, this sounds like what uh, FDR issued during World War II. You know, you, no discrimination. The next year, Reverend Martin Luther King, Ralph Abernathy, and Jackie Robinson arrived for a rally in the state trying to get the Civil Rights, uh, Kentucky Civil Rights Act passed. didn't pass for two years, and it passed, passed under Governor Breath. Two years later, Reverend King is murdered, and there is rioting. I mean, big-time rioting in Louisville now. Black businesses are destroyed. Black churches are bombed. Two black teenagers are killed. Over 500 are arrested. The National Guard is called out. And just a short time later, a white supremacy group tangled with some blacks near Brer College and two whites were killed. It was not a good time. But September 1975, even after that settled down, the court in their stupidity orders busing. And this causes riots, there's injuries, there's arrests, of course there's protests all over the place. And I personally do not believe in busing. I was against it from day one. And the National Guard's called out again. But as bad as all this was, compared to our sister states in the south and some states up north, Kentucky is integrated somewhat peacefully. Kara. Now... Since part of your assignment is to do a critical analysis of the CARA Act, I'm not even going to go over this chapter. Uh, I suggest you read it carefully, and you could even use it in your argument when you were doing your analyzation. But I did want to mention that after Brown v. Board of Education in 54, the salaries for teachers were a little higher. 
the number of degrees awarded to students were increased, and we had something called Kentucky Educational Television come about, which I thoroughly love. So let's spend a little bit of time on higher education. As I said in the opening, the Civil War caused decline or closing of schools, and with all of this, Center College did turn out to last longer and become one of the private schools. And uh, did you know that Center College has a, um, I guess you call it a satellite college in Mexico? Uh, one of my fellow teachers, her daughter is enrolled in Center, and she's taken this semester in Mexico. I thought, how cool. But because of lack of funds and students, it causes a lot of closings. And the Agriculture and Mechanical College, the A&M, was established in 1865, and it became part of the Kentucky University. Um, it was part of the Kentucky University until 1878, which is 13 years, and it became the Kentucky Transylvania College. It didn't happen overnight, and it goes through detail, tells you how in the text that all this happened. But it grows, it buys land, uh, it started agro-experimentation, it started offering some free tuition. It admitted females in 1880. In 1908, it was changed to the State University. And I just threw this in here because it's my alma mater. I happened to graduate from Kentucky Wesleyan College in 1866 it opened. Uh, the Louisville National Medical College and it was for all black students and it metamorphosed into the University of Louisville College System, a uh, University of Louis University of Louisville System. I'm sorry, my tongue's twisted. In 1951. Kentucky State University and the Louisville Municipal College were for all black students. They were underfunded. And if you read that section, you'll see how the presidents they had to walk this fine line to they wanted to increase benefits and opportunities for their students, yet they didn't want to alienate the white population because that's where the funding was coming from. But the number of schools for white students are increasing in the 50s and 60s. And the University of Kentucky grows into a premier school. In 1956, the medical school area was opened. And in 1962, it begins their community college system of which you are a part of today. Or not, you're a part of the community college system, but we're no longer affiliated with U University of Kentucky. But a lot of private schools become state schools, and like, for instance, Northern Kentucky University and University of Louisville. And when this happens, of course, you start competing for state monies, and it begins in earnest. But coming to the 60s, the student protests, the ones you saw on television about, and I thought every school and college in the country was having a demonstration. And I could not understand, in my innocence, why I had wanted to go to college in the 60s, but I didn't have the money. And, uh, of course, at that time, we didn't have all those state-supported grants and things that you could get. So I didn't go to college. And I got so mad at these people who could afford to go to college, and they were wasting their education, in my opinion, by sitting, by doing the sit-ins and urinating on the president's desk and destroying things. I just thought this was disgraceful. I did not know that such a small percentage were involved. It was just the ones that were making the most noise were covered, for instance. Kentucky Wesleyan didn't have a protest. Murray didn't have a protest. University of Kentucky didn't have a protest. But the big schools in, like, you know, California, New York, Ohio University, the big schools, they had some protests. College presidents became targets for legislators in the 60s and 70s, and that whole page in there telling you about some of the problems with the University of Kentucky presidents, um, was some of it true? Sure, some of it was true. Did they do everything they were accused of? No. But when you are at the top of the heap, you are the president of anything, you become the target. And for a while, it was a very precarious position to be holding. But I, I thought that was cute. Back in 1860, right, at the beginning of the Civil War, we started having all these strict rules for colleges. You couldn't drink. You couldn't smoke. You couldn't, couldn't play cards. You couldn't cuss or swear. You couldn't criticize a school. Uh, you could not attend any exhibition of immoral tendency. And I couldn't figure out what for sure they're talking about, but I... I think they're targeting that as the young guys. You had to go to chapel. And in some schools, they had military type rules. I mean, you had to, you know, snap to and work beanies and all kinds of things. But thank heavens, one of the results of the civil rights movement in the 1960s was these crazy rules came to an end. But students do continue their pranks. And it even mentioned about, you know, a horse being on the second floor or somebody's car getting dismantled. I mean, college kids are going to do some crazy things. As long as it doesn't hurt anybody, as long as nothing is destroyed, uh, blowing off steam. But I've got page 394 at that uh, chart of four-year private schools and seminaries as of 1995, which basically is almost 20 years ago. And on 397, listing the state-supported colleges and universities between 1930 and 1990. Kentucky has a lot of schools. And 
unfortunately, it wasn't until late 50s, early 60s that we began to see any kind of aid that you could get to go to school. You had to pay. Now, if you had an excellent academic record, you might get a scholarship for your tuition. If you were a great basketball player or a football player, then you might get a scholarship. But as far as these loans that you get or these grants that you get, they were just not available. So with all the ups and downs, with all the weaknesses and the variety, Kentucky does and will have educated citizens. And, and classrooms all across the state every day. And I see it in some of my classrooms. I talk to people who teach K through 12 in some of their classrooms. You cannot begin to know the feeling a teacher has when she's worked her tail off and her fingers to the bone. And all of a sudden she sees that light come on in her students' eyes. And it doesn't matter whether you're kindergarten or whether you're in college. It, you still see it and it just makes everything so worthwhile. You have been successful. You have reached a student. So there are successes. Does every one of my students a success rate? They're successful because they're there and they're learning and education is never lost. Do I see that light come on in every eye of every one of my students? No. Of course, the subject I'm teaching isn't all that loved either. But I see it frequently. And I come home on cloud nine. That just makes me feel like my life is worthwhile. I touched a student. So we can actually spend an entire semester on the educational system or lack of it in Kentucky. This has been a very brief trip to the civil rights movement and education. So now take a deep breath, complete your quiz and your four questions, and maybe take another deep breath before you go over your test for chapters 21, 22, and 23. Now there's only two more lessons and we're finished. And I'm sure you've noticed that this lesson only contains one chapter. Your next two lessons, 24 and 25, are one chapter each. So the next lesson is one chapter, and your final lesson is one chapter. So your final test is going to be over two chapters. I deliberately scheduled it this way because I know that the last couple of weeks of the semester, every teacher around is remembers things she was supposed to have you do and tries to get it all crammed in the last two or three weeks. And I didn't want you to be tied down doing Kentucky history when you may have you know, algebra, you may have uh, some other class that you've got to pass to get your degree to go on to do what you're doing. Uh, usually, not always, but usually my Kentucky history students take it for one of two or three reasons. One, they're going to be teachers and Kentucky history is required to get your degree. Two, you love history, but those don't happen very often. The other reason is that Human services students, they need a course to fill. And I think sometimes this will satisfy a cultural requirement. Or you're just desperate for another class to fulfill your requirement to stay full time. But I, in my mind, pretend you all love Kentucky history. That's why you took the course. But there again, I'm not going to overload you the last couple of weeks. So this lesson is one chapter, and your next two lessons are one chapter each. And don't forget your critical analysis.